Okay, welcome everybody. My name is Dr. Jackie Jacob. I'm one of the two poultry specialists at the Department of Animal and Food Sciences at University of Kentucky. Dr. Pescatori uh, is the other one. He's uh, co-hosting with me today. Um, again, this is a poultry specific webinar for Kentucky, um, whether or not this is applicable to where you are, some things will be, some things won't. Some of the regulations will vary um, from state to state, but um, we'll try and cover um, as much as possible uh, generalities. Um, please, if you have a question, type it in the chat box. Uh, if it's relevant to what I'm talking about and the clarification of something, Dr. Pescatori will uh, interrupt me to uh, ask the question. If not, we will uh, wait until the end uh, for questions. Please stay on mute the entire time um, so that you're not interrupting uh, other people uh, with noises in the background. So um, again, uh, my name is Dr. Jackie Jacob, and we will be discussing this time uh, waterfowl. Uh, let's see. Oh, okay, start from the beginning. Okay, can you see it, Tony? I'm going to assume you can. Okay, so I said Tony, Stewart, Pescatori, and I are the two specialists here at the University of Kentucky. Uh, this webinar is going to look at raising waterfowl for meat, uh, and most of the regulations, again, are specific for um, Kentucky, but uh, some of the things may be applicable or at least tell you uh, where to start looking for information uh, in the future. So some of the things to consider before you begin raising waterfowl for meat. Um, First question you ask yourself is why? Why do you want to raise the ducks or geese um, for meat? Is it for money? Is it to complement your ongoing operations? Is it for personal use? Any of those reasons are you know, totally legitimate, but they will have different uh, consequences in how you do things. So if you uh, want to make money, then the first thing you need to think about is where will you get the birds processed? <sighs> Two people in there. And that is extremely important. Without a place to process your birds, you cannot sell uh, waterfowl, poultry of any kind in the state of Kentucky. Uh, all meat and poultry that is marketed to the public in the state of Kentucky must be obtained from an approved source. So this means that all meat products must be produced and packaged in an establishment under either a federal, which is USDA, or state uh, inspection program. So you can't just process chickens in the backyard or ducks or geese in the backyard and um, sell them. It has to be in an inspected program, whether it's state or federal. So no processing in the backyard. So home processing or custom processed poultry, meat, including wild game, cannot be sold on, can, in any way on the market. You can't sell it to your neighbor. You can't sell it to the restaurants, you can't sell it to the grocery stores, you can't sell it at the farmer's market. So as I said, if you want to make money from raising waterfowl for meat, you need to have a place to get your birds processed. So where can you get it processed? No place in the state of Kentucky processes waterfowl. We do have two USDA facilities that uh, process chickens and you can use, they may even do turkeys, uh, but they will not do waterfowl because of the problems associated with trying to process waterfowl. 
The uh, Kentucky State University has what's called a mobile processing unit. You have to have a docking station if you want to take it anywhere. So you just can't, you know, take it to your farm and use it. You have to have an official docking station or come to uh, Frankfurt to get it processed there, but they do not do waterfowl. Uh, so I searched the neighboring states and uh, there's nothing in West Virginia, Virginia, Tennessee, Missouri, or Indiana, or North Carolina that process waterfowl. I found one USDA facility in Illinois and one in Ohio. Since you are uh, taking the chickens or the, the ducks or geese for slaughter, you can cross the state lines into Illinois or Ohio to uh, get your birds processed. It's an USDA inspected facility, so you can sell anywhere, including the state of Kentucky, but you can sell uh, to any states if it's processed in a USDA inspected facility. So the, the only poultry places that I found that do poultry, one is in Petersburg, Illinois, um, it's a uh, triple P or uh, poultry.com and uh, Pleasantville poultry in Baltic, Ohio. So you have to expect to travel considerable distance in order to get them processed. They also charge a lot to process waterfowl, uh, anywhere from um, seven to $10 a bird depending on um, the way you want it processed, how much you want uh, done to it, uh, and things like that. So if you want to make money, you have to go to one of those two places. So in order to sell poultry in the state of Kentucky, it has to be federally inspected. Um, and that means they look at every single bird, um, you have to protect it so that it's in proper packaging. You have to either store it frozen or under refrigeration, which is uh, 41 degrees Fahrenheit or below. Additionally, the packaging has to include the uh, safe handling instructions as shown here. You can't modify that. You have to use the, the uh, safe handling instructions that they have. Uh, you also need a use by date or a best by date um, that so that they know you know how much time they have to use it they have before they um, have to throw it out. Uh, in terms of labeling, if you add something that says no added hormones, you must also include the uh, the uh, footnote. Or asterisk that says federal regulations prohibit the use of hormones or steroids in poultry. Nobody raising poultry in the, U the United States ever uses hormones or steroids, aside from the fact that they are not necessary, they are illegal. So if you say that you have no added hormones, you have to clarify to say that you know, nobody uses it. If you use a term like natural, you have to define what that means. So the definition for natural is no artificial ingredients and minimally processed. So you can see that this, uh, this is in this case is a duck. It does have that uh, asterisk besides natural and it tells you at the bottom, no artificial ingredients minimally processed. Uh, any claims that you make, uh, this has no animal byproducts, all vegetable uh, feed, then you have to have the supporting records and data to show that. So you would have to save feed tags to uh, prove that, that those are the ingredients uh, in your feed and that there are no animal byproducts included. Um, and then you sometimes see terms like ducks raised free to roam barns. So this does not mean, this simply means 
they're not kept in cages. Uh, they're still in a poultry house and they're not allowed outside. They're just allowed to walk around in barns. So, you know, if you're using a term, you, you usually best if you could uh, indicate what it means. Okay, you also need to have a recall plan. So anyone engaged in the sale, processing and transportation of meat or poultry must contain record, maintain records to include the purchasing, sales receipts and whatever. So that uh, at any one time, if something happens uh, and a product is found to be a salmonella issue or some other uh, food safety issue and a recall is needed, you need to be able to show who you sold to so that the product can be recalled. So other things to consider, where are you going to get the ducklings or goslings from? Is it a reliable source? Can they supply you what they want? Uh, does their availability match what you want to do? Uh, is the price something that you can make money with if you want to make money? Do they have the type or breed of duck or goose that you want? And it, that in order to cross state lines, it, they have to be from an NPIP hatchery. That is National Poultry Improvement Plan. Uh, so they have to be certified pelorum free. And uh, for the state of Kentucky, they also have to be avian influenza free. So uh, where are you gonna house the ducks and geese? There are regulations about where you can place things. They have to be certain distances from churches, from roads, um, from schools, things like that. So make sure you know the regulations for your area on where you're allowed to locate your ducks and geese. What type of structure are you gonna use? How big is it? Are they gonna have outdoor access? Where are you gonna get the feed? And do they have the type of feed you want? Is it organic, non-GMO? What's the minimum quantity that you have to buy? Do you buy it in bulk or are you gonna buy it bag? That will affect the price. So think about those things. And you know, does it fit into your lifestyle and existing operations? You don't wanna do something that's going to be a burden to you uh, without, you know, just if, you, if you're doing it to make money, is it gonna make you money and make it worth your while? So know your cost and know the price that you can get for your product. So you need a market for all your products. If you're gonna sell cut up products, uh, can you sell all of the, the bird, right? Know all the regulations, uh, with regard to state and federal regulations with regards to the sale of products and also have produced product liability. So you are producing a perishable food. If somebody gets sick, even if you know it's not your fault, they just handled it wrong. If they got sick from your product, then they could sue you. So make sure that you have product liability so that if something happens, heaven forbid, uh, you are covered um, and you're not gonna lose your farm because you're trying to get a little extra income from adding uh, waterfowl to your uh, operation. And so um, we do have a publication on smallflocks.net on uh, poultry producer liability so that make sure that you um, can cover your potential loss, uh, consult with your insurance professional to make sure that uh, you have product liability for your uh, farm. Maybe also consider, you know, making an LLC as well. So think about that. Tony, I'm seeing five people in the waiting room. I don't know if that's true or not, but... Okay, until you're ready to transport your meat and poultry to the market, they must be stored in an approved manner at safe refrigerated or frozen storage temperatures. And this has to be separate from your personal use. So you can't use your home refrigerator 
to store product for sale. It has to be a separate uh, refrigerator or freezer uh, for your product. So products must be stored at zero degrees uh, Fahrenheit if frozen or 40 degrees Fahrenheit or colder if refrigerated. And the product must be transported and maintained at these temperatures constantly. So you can use a freezer that you could hook up to your car or you can use an ice chest or cooler, right? So all units holding uh, refrigerated or frozen product need to contain a thermometer that has been calibrated to make sure that it's working right so that you have continuous monitoring of the product temperature and that you can prove that they never went uh, below uh, or above the, the approved uh, temperatures. And again, these can be with either a freezer or an ice chest or cooler. You need a good quality one, heavy duty ice chest or cooler so that it keeps that uh, temperature down. Styrofoam coolers are not approved for use. Um, they, they can't be washed properly and everything else. So um, make sure you have good quality coolers. Um, make sure that you have enough ice in it that it's going to keep it cool the entire time that you are either selling it or transporting it. Uh, if you use an ice chest, you have to make sure that the meat does not come into direct contact with the ice. So this is an ice cooler example that has um, an area of um, the, a wire above the ice so that the product does not come in contact with the ice. Was there a question, Tony? You're on mute, I can't hear you. Uh, I don't have anybody in the waiting room because I, I, don't, I don't think you have me as a uh, co-host. Oh, I don't have you as a co-host. Okay, right, just a minute. Uh, let me admit all. Um, okay, sorry. Let me stop sharing for a minute to make you a co-host. Forgot to do that. Uh, okay, now you're a co-host. All right, thank you. Yeah, sorry about that, guys. Oops, where was I? Uh, here we go. Oh, here we are. So this this allows the product to be kept away from the meat. Uh, and the ice. So you're not allowed to have the meat, you know, floating around uh, in the, the um, ice water. Additionally, you have to have separate um, coolers for different species. So, um, you know, you have one for duck, one for geese, one for uh, beef or whatever else you're selling, they have to be in separate um, coolers so there's no cross-contamination going on from one species to another. And then there are many different sellable products. A lot depends on who's doing the processing for you. Are you going to cut it up? Are you going to um, sell it whole? There are a number of different products that are um, favored in some of the ethnic markets. So make sure you know your market. Um, you can sell feet and heads and tongues and uh, the internal organs as well. Um, so make sure that you know what, um, what your market is and what products they're gonna wanna buy. Uh, and I won't go into great detail on processing uh, of poultry. That would be a whole webinar on itself, which we did do through the e-extension, which is the National Cooperative Extension Service. Uh, it details in the, the webinar how to slaughter and process poultry. It does cover all the different types of poultry, including waterfowl, are discussed there. Uh, if you are home processing, this is only for your home consumption. Uh, excuse me, I have a cat here driving me nuts. Sorry. Uh, 
Shoot, stupid cat. What did you do to me? Whoops. Uh, so if you're home slaughtering for your own consumption, uh, there's typically a feed withdrawal time. This reduces fecal and pathogen contamination of the poultry carcasses. The time varies de uh, depending on uh, the species and what they are eating, but it can be anywhere from eight to 12 hours off feed. Water's not taken away when they're in the poultry house. And that eight to 12 hours without feed includes transportation. So you do need to do a feed withdrawal before you take it to a processing facility. They'll tell you what uh, withdrawal time they want um, and travel time and wait time for processing are included in that withdrawal time. So uh, you want it long enough to allow the digestive tract to be completely empty, but short enough that the intestines don't begin to uh, break down. So again, if you're doing home consumption, what's the difference between processing chickens versus waterfowl? So with chickens, you can basically slaughter at any age. It doesn't really affect too much how easy it is to, um, to pluck them. You can stun them or not stun them. Uh, electrical or gas stunning is usually done commercially. Uh, then you cut the jugular so that they bleed out. So you stun them so they're unconscious when you cut the jugular and they bleed, they bleed out and, and die. Uh, then you scald them to loosen the feathers and then you pluck to remove the feathers. And that sounds really easy, but for waterfowl, that's not so easy. So feathers can be uh, extremely hard to remove from waterfowl, except at certain times. So there are certain times when they're sort of going through a molt and it's easier to uh, with to remove the feathers, that does not mean that it's easy, it just means easier. And again, you can stun electrical or gas, you still cut the jugular so that they bleed out. But then you have two options. The first is to just skin it so that you remove the skin and feathers at the same time and uh, you don't have to deal with plucking. Uh, if you want to pluck it, then you uh, scald and pluck like you would the chickens, but then you cover it in wax and the, remove the feathers with the wax. So it's an additional step required in order to remove all of the feathers from the carcass. So this is an example um, from the sufficient self-sufficient home acre website where they skin the chicken, the, uh, in this case, it's a duck, uh, so that they don't have to deal with um, the feathers. They, they skin it and then they eviscerate it. Uh, if you want the skin on, as I said, you can scald. Uh, it's a higher temperature than for chickens. So chickens is usually 130 to 135 degrees Fahrenheit, but for ducks and geese, you go up to about 155. <clears throat> it's also a longer period of time than for chickens. For chickens, it's definitely under a minute, but for ducks and geese, you may have to go two to three minutes. So you need to try different times. And then you put the, the wax on and then take the wax off and the wax comes off with the feathers. So this is an example from the smallfarmersjournal.com on how to uh, clean and get those uh, feathers off of uh, a waterfowl carcass. In this case, it, it's ducks. And if you're working, you know, if you're producing for your for your home, there are, you know, for those that are into gourmet type things, there are a lot of different products that you can make with ducks. I, uh, we do have a person who's done it with geese. Um, so you can either use the, the whole duck, um, you can collect the duck fat and use it for cooking. Uh, foie gras is basically fatty liver in French, and uh, it's basically uh, a pate, you know, for putting on crackers that you make from the liver. 
You can make duck bacon. You can ground up the duck meat and make duck burgers. You can make duck pastrami, duck salami, duck prosciutto, and uh, duck confit, which is basically um, duck uh, cooked in its own fat as a preservative. So you could, there's a lot of, you know, if you want to try some culinary uh, things, then, you know, duck is a great way to go. Whoops. Um, there is similar things for geese. Uh, okay. So in terms of what breeds can you use, um, Pekin is the typical breed that people think about for, uh, for uh, duck meat. Um, it's got white feathers, so it's, you know, gives a cleaner carcass. Uh, but not all pecans are the same. So Metzer Farms and Purely Poultry, they sell the Grimard hybrid pecans. Grimard is a, um, a company out of France that has a line of ducks that they produce uh, that are hybrids. Uh, and these are like the, the broilers of, of ducks. Um, so in 41 to 49 days, they're, they are ready to um, be slaughtered. So at 41 days, you're getting about a seven pound bird. And at 49 days, an eight pound bird. The evisceration weight is about 65% and 25% um, of the body weight is, is breast filet. They don't have as good a feed conversion as chickens. Uh, but it's better than some of the other ducks. So a 2.29. So for every pound of uh, body weight gain, you're going to need 2.29 pounds of feed. But as I said, not all pecans are the same. So Murray McMurray sells a jumbo pecan, uh, bred for size, not for show. It's uh, 15 to 18% larger than the standard white pecans, and it can weigh anywhere from 9 to 13 pounds. Um, Hoover's Hatchery, they say their, their pecan duck can be processed in 40 days, so it's probably the Grimard, but they don't say that, uh, at about a 7-pound weight. Uh, and just a clarification, so Pekin and Peking. Um, Pekin is a breed of duck. Uh, Pekin is a famous duck dish from um, Beijing, China. Uh, has been prepared been prepared for for uh, eons, you know, since the imperial era, and it's considered one of national China's national foods. This is different than Pekin duck. Uh, and then, of course, the other popular um, duck for meat is the Muscovy. And the Muscovy is not really a duck. It's a totally different species. All of the domestic ducks that we have, except for the Muscovies, are descendants from the, the common mallard. The Muscovy is uh, from South America instead of North America. As a result, it has a lower fat content. So it's said to be 98% fat free. Um, so it doesn't quack, it hisses like a goose and they are able to fly. They're one of the few ones that can fly. What are you doing? Excuse me. Stop eating that. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay. Sorry about that. My dog is eating something he's not supposed to. She's not supposed to. So, um, so they can fly. I remember when we used to raise uh, Muscovy ducks, they used to fly around the house all the time. They also like to perch. They're one of the few ducks uh, that likes to perch. So uh, the Muscovies, it takes about 70 to 85 days to raise them up compared to the 42 to 45 days for the pecans. Uh, and there is a big difference between females and males. For most domestic ducks, the male and female are very similar in weights, but for the Muscovies, there is uh, that sexual dim dimorphism with the females being considerably smaller than the males. Um, but they have 50% more breast meat than the pecan ducks. And as I said, the, 
they are considerably leaner than the pecan. The skin is much less fat than you would typically find uh, in the pecan duck. So this just gives you some of the examples of uh, the nutritional content for Muscovy duck meat. Um, and you would need a nutrition label for what it, if you're selling it as a packaged product, you would need to have a label that you could use for your duck to know what the nutrition content is here in the United States. We have to have nutrition labels on all the products that we sell, food products. Um, as I said, the Muscovy is a different species than the domestic duck. You can cross the, the Muscovy um, with other ducks, but the result is typically an infertile um, bird. So uh, a moulard is basically a cross between a Muscovy male and a Pekin female. When they are doing that commercially, they have to use artificial insemination. And even then they only get 80% fertility. If allowed to mate naturally, fertility is only about 20 to 30%. So if, you know, if you're going into moulard production, you have to use artificial insemination. And while a pecan has a 28-day incubation period and Muscovies have a 35-day incubation period, the Moulard is a 32-day uh, incubation period. And typically, 60% of the, the ducklings that hatch out are males. Um, and the Moulard is basically French for mule, which means they're, and they are infertile. And they are quite common in Europe and Asia because of the larger size, the quality of the liver and the reduced carcass content. Um, they are, are used a lot in the foie gras production. Uh, if you do the reverse cross of a Pekin male with a Muscovy female, uh, you get what's called a heeny, he, henny. Uh, it's not grown commercially. Um, the males are definitely bigger than the females like the Muscovies, but the females look like Pekins, but they can't uh, fly like the Muscovies. Uh, another breed that is often used uh, in uh, some of the more backyard type flocks is the, the ro Rowan. Um, they look like mallards, but because of the extra weight, they can't fly. They are a dual purpose type breed, um, and some have used them for meat production. Uh, the Duclair is a, a one that's been recently introduced into the United States from Europe. It gives a five to six pound bird in about seven to 12 weeks. And they say it has more of an earthy tasting meat compared to uh, other ducks. So depending on what your interest is uh, in duck meat, uh, what flavor you're looking for, that may be something of interest. Uh, the Saxony is another dual purpose breed. It has a light colored coat. Uh, it was actually developed in Germany by Albert Franz um, using the Pekin, Roe and Buff and Blue Pomeranian breeds. During World War II, it sort of died out because he was a prisoner of war. Uh, but when he was released at the end of the war, he did um, recreate his breed. And so some people have been using it as a, a meat type bird. It's not going to be as feed efficient as some of the other breeds. Uh, in terms of geese, what geese breeds, uh, so while the ducks are descendants from the mallards, we have two ancestors to the different breeds of geese that we have. Some are descendants from the Greylag goose of Europe, which is shown here. Uh, other breeds are descendants of the swan goose of Asia. And some are a cross between the two. They, they are compatible, they can mate, and they have make such matings have been used in the development of some of the uh, domestic uh, geese breeds that we have today. So in terms of meat, the one that is typically used the most is the Ebden goose. 
It's the tallest. It reaches about three feet tall. It's pure white, but I'm told that the goslings can be sexed based on down color at about three weeks of age. And it usually takes about 112 days to, to reach a market weight, a live weight of 15.7 pounds, and which gives you an evisceration weight of 11.5 pounds with a feed conversion ratio of five to one. One of the advantages of geese though, is that they do well uh, with foraging. You can reduce the amount of feed they get. Uh, by supplementing with good quality forage, uh, unlike the duck that, that can't really do that with. Uh, Pilgrim geese is another one. This is actually an American breed. It's one, of, it's the most easy going of them. If you're using them for weeding, um, the Pilgrim is usually the one that you use. And it's the only sex linked uh, breed so that you can tell males from females on the basis of color. And they weigh about 13 to 15 pounds uh, when it's time for processing. The Toulouse goose uh, is also a bit used for, for meat, uh, but there are production and exhibition strains. So when you are looking on online, you know, from a hatchery, make sure that you're getting a production strain. The production strains typically don't have the dewlap, which is that thing that is hanging down from their chin, and their body cavity is not quite as big so that they don't look as full. So they won't do very good in a show, but they are, that's not what you're raising them for uh, if you're raising them for meat. So make sure that you know what you're buying, uh, what type of strain you're buying when you buy uh, go your goslings online. Uh, African geese is another one that, that's used. Um, they do have that knob on there, which can be prone to frostbite in the winter, but it takes about two to three years for that to fully develop. And if you're raising them for meat, you'll have slaughtered them before then. And the meat of the, the African is a little bit uh, leaner than for um, other, other geese breeds. And there's, you know, there's many different types you can choose from. The Sebastopol on the left there with the fancy feathering. Uh, and then, of course, the Chinese geese on the right. Um, so, you know, there are different kinds out there depending on what you're looking for. And um, you can go to our website, which you can get through, through from smallflocks.net. It has a list of different hatcheries. All the ones on there are mail order hatcheries, which means they have to be NPIP in order to be uh, to cross the state lines. Uh, you also need a certificate saying that they are avian influenza free. Um, or, before they can be imported into the state of Kentucky. So once you get your goslings or your ducklings, you know, make sure that they're well dried, they have long fluff down, bright red, eye, bright active eyes, they look active and alert, they have healed navels right before they, the ducklings or goslings hatch, they take the yolk into them and that seals up in what will become the, the navel. The legs should be bright and waxy to the touch, and you don't want a lot of deformities, no crooked legs, no twisted necks, cross, cross bills, stuff like that. So as I said, right before they hatch, the, the hatchlings take in the yolk sac through the navel, and then once the yolk sac is fully absorbed, the navel um, heals up. And, and dries out. So as long as you can't see it, that's usually an indication that it's well healed. Uh, you usually only see the navel when it's infected. Uh, in terms of housing, you can you know, just raise in inside the whole time. A lot of the commercial operations for poultry, for um, duck or goose meat do that. They raise them completely, well, for ducks, not so much for geese, but raise them entirely inside. You need a brooding area and then a growing area. You need litter on the floor. 
Um, cages are not recommended for grow out for the entire period. You can brood them a little bit, um, you know, the first two weeks maybe, um, but you can have a lot more problems with breast blisters and leg problems on cages. So we typically don't recommend cages for, um, for meat type birds. And then if you're going to do pasture poultry, so you're going to have them outside, you still need to brood them indoors. The brooding period can vary depending on the time of year. Right here now in Kentucky, we're having 80 degree weather, so you could probably get them out you know, at three weeks of age, no problem. Some, you know, if you start them earlier, you might want to keep them inside till they're a little older. Um, so, but you still need to have that brooding period before you put them outside. I, and we do have a publication on predator management because if you are outside, predators are going to be a problem. Um, you can use the small movable bottomless pens uh, that you can use for, for chickens. You, you can use them for uh, ducks and geese as well. They're moved on a regular basis to prevent the buildup of the manure. So say so we have a publication on pasture poultry and we have a publication on predator management in Kentucky. And we do have a publication on how to make the hoop pens. Uh, we also have some videos to help you, uh, you know, walk you through how to do it as well. Once they're larger, they can be let out during the day and only locked up at night, or you can provide a guard dog or some other guard animal to, um, to keep them safe. Um, and ducks and geese do forage relatively well, especially geese, um, so that you can supplement the, the feed to some degree. You may, with ducks, that may draw out the, the growth period a little bit, but can cut, you, cut down on your feed costs a little bit. Um, so that, um, you know, ducks and geese are, you know, can be amazingly resistant to cold weather once they're fully feathered. And so if they are outside a windbreak, you know, that is bedded on the protected side with dry litter can be sufficient unless the temperature drops down to zero degrees. Um, and when you're raising them for meat that, you know, typically you're not doing it in the winter, but you could do it in the winter if you wanted. Uh, as I said, ducks and geese are good foragers, so they can help supplement the feed. They can keep the grass down and fertilized. Um, they're really good at helping to weed orchards. Um, the use of ducks for weed control depends on the breed of duck, the type of crop that they're weeding, and depends on the training that you provide them. There is a publication online on using um, ducks as weeders. Um, and then remember, of course, that ducks poop a lot. They eat a lot, but they poop a lot. So it's best to not use them on crops that are eaten raw. So, you know, anything that's going to be in a salad as a raw product should not be weeded um, by any type of poultry because of the risk of salmonella. Geese are much better for weeding uh, than, than ducks. Um, the, they have found that geese um, can utilize forage much better than any of the other poultry species. They don't know why. It seems to have something to do with the types of um, microbes that inhabit their digestive tract. The types of microbes that, that inhabit there tend to be able to digest cellulose. So uh, geese tend to be better weeders uh, and can live more on the forages than the ducks. Um, Chinese geese are often used as weeders. They have nibble neck, nimble necks that allow them to pull the weeds close to the crops so that you know, a, a machine going through or even hoeing by hand you know, might not get those weeds. They'll, they will get them. They prefer grasses. Although the, you know they don't really like the broadleaf weeds, but you can train them to eat those types of weeds. 
They recommend 25 to 30 geese per acre for weeding and then rotate them around so that, you know, once they finish off the weeds in one area, move them to the to another. Um, and it, they geese that are at least eight weeks old can be out 24 seven, you know, just make sure they have a little shelter to get out of the, um, the weather if needed. And as I said, make sure you rotate them around so that they have something to actually eat. As I said, raising them on wire is not recommended, but you can brood them on wire for a short period of time. Uh, you don't want to do it for any of the, the bantam type breeds, the, like the cull ducks, because their hawks will fall through the wire and become trapped. Uh, you don't want to use any newspaper or slippery surfaces because that can cause uh, leg injuries. Uh, the uh, ducks and geese grow a lot faster than chickens. And so you need to make sure that they have room to grow. Crowding can reduce growth rate and increase mortality. So make sure that they have enough room to, to you know, for as they get bigger. And so for ducks, you know, and geese, they say, you know, have about a half a square foot per bird to start off with for the first week with ducks. At three weeks, you double it, five weeks, double it again, and seven weeks, double it again, and then they can go outside. With geese, you also start at the half square foot per, per uh, gosling, but by the second week, you're already doubling it, third week, already doubling it, fourth week, already doubling it. So uh, you need to make sure that they have enough room to grow uh, as they get bigger. So during the brooding period, there's three things that you need to, to think about. You need the heat, the water, and the feed. So uh, the typical way of heating has always been the infrared heat lamps, but this can be a fire risk, especially if hung by the, the socket itself. Um, so please do not do that. We have had houses burned down because heat lamps have either shorted out or have fallen into the bedding material and caused a fire. So please, if you're going to use the infrared heat lamps, make sure that you um, have a proper system for hanging them. So make sure one that they have a porcelain socket that can handle the, the heat of the heat lamp, a reflector to help direct the heat down. Uh, and again, don't hang it from the socket. So this comes with a, a, a clip that you can use to, to hang it and then have a safety chain. If the clip suddenly comes undone, the safety chain will keep it from falling into the uh, litter and causing a fire. You adjust the temperature by either adjusting the wattage and they come in 125 and 250 watts or by increasing or decreasing the height of the heat lamp. Um, oh, so I said that already. Okay, so you can, if you're doing large numbers, you might wanna consider a gas brooder. They can be natural or propane type gases, but um, you need a lot of birds to make that uh, worthwhile. Um, so I say ducklings, goslings are unable to regulate their body temperature till about 12, 14 days of age. Fluctuations of body temperature can uh, stress the birds and have a negative effect on performance. And uh, we recommend a brooder guard. This is a really good way to, to uh, lay it out. So you have the heat source in the middle, you have the automatic waterers and then some um, smaller waters and then the feeders and you can see they've used some trays to put some supplemental feed on so that when you put the chicks there that they have easy access to the feed and water they can move close to or away from the heat source as they want uh, and they can easily access the feed and water um, that you provide them so uh, in terms of temperature, basically it's 90 degrees Fahrenheit um, at, uh, when you place them under the heat source, so for the first 10 days, and then you reduce it 
by five degrees and then each week you reduce it by another five degrees till you get about 70 degrees Fahrenheit and then you shouldn't need any more supplemental heat. If you're brooding during a uh, very, oh, make sure that you measure uh, three inches above the litter, which is about where, you know, where the ducklings or goslings are. You don't want it, you know, way up where you are. You want it down where the temperature of what the chickens, I mean, the, the hatchlings are uh, experiencing. If it's extremely cold outside when you're brooding, you uh, at 10 days, instead of reducing it five degrees, just reduce it three degrees. And then each week after that, instead of reducing it five degrees, reduce it just three degrees till you get that 70 degrees. As I said, the brooder guard, uh, we recommend those. It makes about 12 inches high, can be cardboard, hinged, wood circle, anything. You want it three to five, four feet from the edge of the uh, heat source. It helps prevent drafts. It keeps the, the chicks close to the heat source. They can't wander away and get chilled. Uh, and it prevents them from crowding up anywhere. You only need it for about the first week and then you can re uh, remove it. And uh, it is best to uh, observe the birds. That will tell you more than the temperature itself how well they're doing. So once they've learned where the heat feed and water source, they should move around comfortably and be well distributed throughout that uh, brooding area. If they're crowded really close together, then that means that it's too cold. So you need to lower the heat lamp or heat, you know, basically turn up the heat uh, because they are too cold. And then of course, if they're trying to get as far away from the heat source as, as possible, it's too hot. So you want to uh, you know, lift up the heat source so that it's not as hot. Um, by six or seven weeks of age, they should be able to, um, you know, go outside if you want to put them out on range. Um, how much of that range is going to help them depends on what it is. So you can't make a blanket statement about how much they're going to get from the range. It depends on the crop, depends on the birds, uh, depends on a lot of things. In terms of water, um, when you place the hatchlings, you need to teach them to drink. So just dip their bills into the water. Um, when they come in the mail, the first thing they need is water. So as soon as you get them, make sure you get them on water right away. Um, there are many different types of waters. Uh, and the type depends on the, how many birds you have, the weather conditions. Um, the whether it's an automatic or or manual uh what you know where's your location the height of the birds this is a, a bird water a duck water that you can get um that you just hang it from a bucket um you can raise uh ducks and geese on nipple drinkers um ducks do a little bit better than the geese with uh, nipple drinkers because they like to dip their heads in the water um, and so it helps with the eyes. So sometimes with geese that are on nipple drinkers and can't dip their heads in the water, um, they tend to have um, eye problems. So you have to watch out for that. Uh, and if, it, you know, in the summer, you might want to move the water outside so that your poultry house is not getting as wet because they can be uh, extremely uh, sloppy with the water. Uh, if you're trying to do it in the winter, uh, this is a, uh, a duck water, it works just as well for geese. It comes heated and unheated. So uh, if you, you know, prevent the water from freezing, uh, it does have those filter cups and uh, spell spill proof reservoir of water. So that's uh, one way that you can do it as well. Uh, you can get these automatic waters that you just hook up to a hose. These would work best, you know, especially for geese because then they can stick their 
their heads in there and they can get their eyes uh, wet. Make sure that you clean them um, to prevent uh, any mess from growing up in there. And it, it's all automatic. Um, it has its own flotation thing that, that has the correct temperature, I mean, the correct height, um, but it, they can't get in there and bathe in it or cause, you know, make it really dirty. They will put some feet in there, so you need to make sure that you clean it out on a regular basis. Um, and then, of course, you can get some cups that you can use as well. Um, it's a low pressure system that you can add to, to buckets. Again, make sure that you adjust the height um, as the birds get older. Um, if using the portable waters on the floor, you know, after two weeks, you need to place it on a wire covered stand about four inches high. It helps to keep the litter dry. Um, and, you know, it's good to have an area where they can get up in out of the, the bedding and um, do their drinking and, and the, any spilt water is separated from the, the manure and not causing uh, as much of an ammonia buildup. Um, and you don't have to change the litter as, as often. Make sure that you don't give cold water to the ducklings or goslings. Um, so be careful once you flush the lines out, you know, that, that you're not getting cold water in there. Um, allow the water time, time to warm up, you know, so the ducks are comfortable drinking. And you can add vitamins and electrolytes to the water if that's what you want to do, that's fine. Um, but avoid sugar-based products because those can uh, cause the growth of microorganisms in the water. So um, don't you you know don't supplement with sugar. Um, just use potable water, and you know if you want to, you can put the vitamins and electrolytes. Typically, if you have a good feed, that's not necessary. But if you want to get them up to a good start, some people feel comfortable more comfortable if they do that. And waterfowl, although we think of them as, you know, loving to swim, and I guess they really do love to swim, for the first three weeks when they only have the down feathers, it's best to not let waterfowl swim or become excessively wet. They can get chilled um, and die, so you need to be careful about that. Um, and if you don't have a good way for them to get out of the water, they could actually drown. Um, so ducks and geese do not need bathing water to remain healthy. Um, and providing them with swimming water can result in wet housing. So, you know, you have to sort of balance that out. Um, if you're mating, then, you know, that's different. But if you're just raising them for meat, they don't really need a water source. In terms of feed, uh, always provide convenient access to feed and water. Uh, don't keep feeders' waters too close together because they'll take the feed and then put it in the water and contaminate it. So you want them to walk at least a little bit of distance. Um, chicken feeders and waters can typically be used if the openings are large enough for the waterfowl to put their heads in. Um, and then increase the space available for eating as the birds grow. Um, so that they're, the, all the birds should be able to eat at the same time. Uh, give them a good, you know, um, feed to get them off to a good start. Uh, we do have a, um, a publication on the smallflocks.net on how to read a feed tag and what are the legal requirements of a feed tag um, in terms of what you want to uh, look for when you're buying a feed. It's best to only give unmedicated feed. It is debatable whether or not you can or cannot give medicated chicken medicated feed to ducks. Some say yes, some say no. Uh, it's best to avoid it, um, especially you know if you're raising them for yourself, you don't necessarily want them to have the medicated feed. Um, if available, a starter mash specifically formulated for waterfowl is best. Um, so for the first three weeks, feed them a mash. Um, but then after that, you want to switch to either a pellet or a crumble. Um, they prefer the pellets. There's less wastage with the pellets. Um, they And the, the mash tends to get clogged in their, their nostrils and cause all sorts of problems. So um, 
the starter feed can be mashed, but the, the grower feed should be a pellet of some sort. Uh, so for the first two to three weeks, you know, fairly high protein, 20 to 22. Um, as I said, you know, it can be a chicken meat feed if, if need be. If you can't get a waterfowl feed, just try to make sure that it's unmedicated if possible. Um, and you'll find that the ducks uh, need about the 22. The chicken, the geese may get down to the 20 and not have as much problems. Uh, and then you can lo lower the crude protein after about three weeks to about 16%. Um, ducks and geese are susceptible to mycotoxins. Um, and an adult duck typically eats about one third to a half a pound of feed per day. How much the geese will eat very much depends on the type of feed and the geese. And as I said, geese are much better with forages than ducks. And so, uh, you know, in some cases, you can just leave the, the geese on the forage if it is a good forage and they're sufficient for all the birds. Um, but having it, you know, some supplementation is always best. Um, and then when they're about three weeks old, you can give them some leafy greens or allow them a limited time on range. And it's best to provide them grit before giving them access to the green plants. Chicken, uh, poultry, birds don't have teeth and they have a gizzard that is important for um, grinding up the feed and the grit helps with that. So make sure that anything that's Anytime they're feeding leafy greens that they have the, the grit available. Um, geese on pasture, as I said, ideally, you know, if, the gra if they have grass that's like, you know, no more than four inches high, young, fresh grass, they can live almost, you know, totally on that. They will also consume bugs, snails, slugs, and worms. Um, and surprisingly, I was reading that uh, in terms of, of wildlife, I mean, I've always had had geese that, you know, they were the attack animals so that, you know, any predator that came around, the geese were usually pretty good about fighting them off. I've even seen a goose chase off a, a bobcat, but for some reason they have trouble with foxes. So um, I read that. Um, I have not experienced that. As I said, most of the time I've seen geese, they've been able to fend for themselves, but um, this one page said that, that foxes could be a problem. Um, they recommended three and a half feet high, three to four feet high fence will help contain them, uh, especially if you're rotating them around on different pastures. If it's a heavy, heavy type breeding stock, then you need, you can have five geese to the acre. If they're a little bit lighter breed, maybe six geese to the acre. And if you're growing the small, you know, the small goslings, then you can have 250 geese to the acre. Um, but if you're raising them, you know, like that, you might want to supplement a little bit more, but um, make sure that the forage is good and, you know, fresh growth, not old growth, um, so that they can get. Uh, stuff out of it. Orchards uh, are ideal environment for geese. If you're raising them there, they provide summer uh, shade. Um, grasses can grow lush and green. They can keep the orchard trim. They can clear away any of the windfalls, you know, the fruits of that fall down. Uh, but you have to be really careful if you have young trees, the geese will strip the bark off of new trees. And if in the picture, like you see there, they have access to water, you have to be really careful to see where that water is flowing to because they will poop in it. And so you have to watch how many you're having. You don't want to have contaminated water uh, as a supply source. So if they do have access to water, make sure that you are watching out for pollution from the fecal material. Um, where I, I grew up, the, the, there was a, a goose duck and goose farm, and they had access to a creek, and um, it was a, you know, a real pollution problem for the whole area because of the fecal material in the, the water that they had access to. So you have to be careful about that. 
Some of the most common errors that we see when raising poultry of any kind is feeding the wrong type of feed. Uh, some people try to think that they can um, you know, make it cheaper by feeding scratch grains or cracked corn. That's a high energy type of ingredient. Uh, poultry eat to meet their energy requirement. So if you're trying to make sure that they get a nice nutritious meal with their the complete feed and then you dilute it with scratch grains or uh, crap corn, you're going to end up with a nutritional deficiency. Not having a not enough feeders or water space can be a problem. And then if you are depending on free ranging, if, if you don't adjust, you know, for the changing in season and the differences in availability of feed, that can be an issue as well and result in nutritional deficiencies. Uh, during the brooding period, getting them off to eating is a good start. Uh, chick the poultry have crop on the outside of the body cavity near the neck. And so once you've placed them on there, make sure that you check that crop. Uh, this is for chicks, but it, it works for, for ducks and geese as well. Make sure that by 24 hours, all the birds that you placed have a full crop. It shows that they are eating. Um, and of course, they won't eat if they can't drink. So that tells you that they're getting off to a good start. Uh, bedding material, we, you know, is a, uh, they serve many functions. They absorb moisture. This is specifically important with waterfowl because they tend to have a much more watery um, excreta. Uh, it also dilutes the excreta so they're not coming as much in contact with it. Um, so it minimizes that bird to manure contact and then it provides insulation from cold floor temperatures. A variety of different products can be used as, as bedding material. Um, pine shavings is basically the gold star that everything else is com compared to it. Rice hulls works. Hardwood shavings, you have to be careful about tannins. Sawdust, you have to be careful because they might eat it, but it also is prone to molds. Uh, straw works, and it can be wheat straw, you know, um, rye straw, whatever, but chopped, it needs to be chopped up into like one and a half inch pieces. Um, you have to be careful, it tends to cake a bit. Uh, peanut hulls can be used, but again, caking can be a problem. And with peanuts, aflatoxin, which is a mycotoxin, can be a problem. Um, you can use paper, you know, especially shredded paper, um, not glossy type paper, but again, it can cake as well. Cake just means that the manure gets there and pile, you know, makes it so that it sticks together. Um, remove any caked material and replace it with fresh litter uh, as needed. Uh, in terms of uh, catching ducks and geese, you know, slowly walk into the area, don't chase them uh, and never carry them by their legs. We tend to do that with chickens, but duck and geese have weak legs and you'll break them. Um, Place one hand around the neck near the body, place the other hand over the bird's back at the wings, uh, then take your other, your hand that was on the neck and put it underneath uh, the palm so that the bird's weight is supported on your forearm. And then you can lift them up and carry them, hold the legs between your fingers to prevent them from scratching, hold the wings to prevent them from flapping. As I said, do not grab them by the legs. Um, for, for short distances, uh, lighter birds, uh, especially the ducks, can be carried by the wings, um, but never do that with the heavier ducks or geese because it, it's not uh, safe for them that you could damage them that way. In terms of telling the males from the females, uh, for ducks, uh, because they're descendants from the mallard, except for the Muscovies, you can tell based on the uh, sex feathers on the male ducks. Um, and so male ducks, even though they're, you know, the pecans are the same color, you can see the sex feathers, the curls on the tail. Um, they also call them drake feathers. The females, of course, don't have them. Um, you can also 
do it on the va basis of sound. So the call of the males is soft and hoarse. The call of the females is more of that distinct quacking noise that we hear. And um, let me uh, reshare this because I forgot to share my sound. Oh crap, I lose it from the thing. Where are you? Okay, go back to where you were. Okay. So this time you should be able to hear the sound. So that's what males sound like. And that's what females sound like. So if you can't tell by the great feathers, you can usually tell by the type of sound that they make. Um, for for geese, um, vent sexing is the most reliable method. Uh, it can be used for ducks, but it's primarily used for um, for geese. Uh, and so mature males, they have the, the uh, you can see the male organ unsheathed. Um, sometimes it's, it can be difficult to see it in the males. Um, you can, you know, it's, it basically, if you get the, the, what they call the genital eminence, uh, the rosette thing, it's easier to say that it's female than to say that it's male, but um that's the difference between them so um you get the male organ in the and it's not present in the female in terms of your daily care you know go into the house daily make sure you look at the birds make sure that they're not avoiding any particular areas make sure that they're not panting uh, make sure that they're all feeding and moving around the house make sure there's no areas of caked over litter no water or feed spills make sure that the feeders and waters are adjusted to the right height make sure there's no spoiled feed in the feeders Make sure it's cleaned up, you know, daily and, and not just adding, you know, on top of old feed. Make sure there isn't any funny respiratory noises. So know what are the normal vocalizations so that you can compare it to what you're hearing day to day. How does the feed smell? Does it smell fresh or musty? How's the air? Make sure you don't have too much ammonia. If you can smell the ammonia, it's already causing damage to the respiratory system. Periodically pick up one of the birds, make sure the feet and hawks are doing all right. Make sure the vent near the end has no dropping sticking to it. Make sure the beak and tongue are all right. Uh, in this way, the bill and the tongue. Um, no signs of discoloration of the tongue. Make sure the crop's full, that they're eating, but the crop's not overly hard. Um, make sure that, you know, they're showing general health and welfare uh, indicators. Um, check the eyes, the skin, the breasts, the feathering, the legs. Um, again, make sure that you're checking how your birds are doing. Make sure you check the litter by grabbing a handful of it every once in a while to see how it's doing. Um, remove any caked litter, top dress as necessary. Um, I shouldn't have roosts in there. That was from a different one. Uh, biosecurity is a term used to basically protect the, the flock from a biological threat. So, Make sure that you get your, your birds from an NPIP certified hatchery. Don't go to the local um, you know, swap meet. Truck, uh, most of the, the feed stores are getting them from NPIP hatchery, so that's usually not a problem. If you have different ages, keep them separate. Always work with the youngest first and then finish up with the oldest. Make sure that you keep the litter dry, clean up any water spills immediately, remove any wet or cracked litter. Don't mix species, it's always best not to. Make sure the feed is good, make sure the water is potable. Try not to have any visitors. If you do, limit them as much as possible. 
any employee shouldn't have private fox that could have disease that they could bring with them. Any disease problems that you have, deal with it immediately. Um, and uh, so I'm sorry it says turkeys, but uh, proper dispose of any dead birds, keep out wild birds, rodent and insect control program. If you're getting birds that are dying, send them to the necropsy lab, the, the diagnostic lab for uh, testing, costs about $70 for up to three, that should be three birds. Um, to find out what's going on, you 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 want to catch it as soon as possible to to uh, get rid of any problem. It's best to submit the birds through a veterinarian so that they can help you understand the report and uh, develop a, a plan for dealing with whatever is the cause of the problem. So. Benefits of a biosecurity plan, keeps out disease, reduces the risks of sick birds, limits the spread of the disease, improves the overall health of the flock, reduces mortality losses, but a biosecurity program is only good if you follow it. So make sure that you're following the, of the biosecurity program. Make sure that you are recording um, feed consumption so that it, it Often the first sign of a disease is a drop in feed consumption. So if you're recording daily feed consumption and something goes down, that will tell you that there's a problem and you need to see what it is. It may be that there was a water line problem and they couldn't drink so they couldn't eat. Um, so maybe it's not a disease problem, but always you know, keep track of the, um, the feed consumption and any mortality recorded on a daily basis so that I mean, people, birds are gonna die now and then. The more birds you have, the more likely you, it is to have dead birds. Always keep records of everything. So in summary, know your market, start with good feed, birds, have a good quality feed, build a relationship with your processor if you are trying to make money from it, know your costs and your cash flow required if you're selling a product, make sure you have product liability, have good management with good housing, environment, and a biosecurity uh, program that you follow. You are producing a perishable food, whether it's for yourself or for sale. So always make sure that you're taking care. Make sure that you wash your hands every time you handle the birds or anything related to the birds so that you don't get yourself sick. Um, this is especially important if you have small children, make sure that they're not handling the birds and then sucking their thumbs and rubbing their eyes or something like that. So. Uh, always take care around poultry. In terms of the resources, if you go to smallflocks.net, we have resources that cover general poultry information, youth poultry programs for the state of Kentucky, small and backyard flocks. Uh, we do have some stuff for commercial poultry production, some basic consumer education stuff, and some urban poultry resources. We do have the Facebook page that most of you went to to find uh, how to sign up for this uh, webinar. There is also the electronic version of the National Cooperative Extension Service. We have a site specifically for small and backyard flocks, it's poultryextension.org. We have a Facebook page. Uh, we do webinars, we do have some upcoming and we have recorded webinars. We write articles as a blog. There is an ask an extension feature where you type in your question and it gets sent to the system and you get an answer. That can take two to three days. It's faster to email me directly if you're in the state of Kentucky uh, with a poultry question and I will get back to you as soon as I can. And that is what I have. Are there any questions? Were there any questions, Tony? Oh, no, there's no questions. Okay, you got a few minutes. Uh, we'll give you a few minutes. If you have a question, just type it in the chat box. This is the, the last of, um, I don't know, what did we do? Six webinars um, on poultry in the state of Kentucky. We looked at eggs and then we, this was the three on, on meat. 
We are looking for um, more topics that people might be interested in with regards to poultry. Um, so if you have a topic that you would like to see discussed in a webinar, email me, let me know what it is. Uh, we'll try to put something together. Uh, we do have a 4-H uh, program for poultry as well that you know, if you want to get involved in that, email me and I'll let you know about that. Um, yeah, I think that's, I know there was, I don't know if there's any interest in, in hatcheries for Kentucky or something like that, but, you know, we can pretty much cover anything that, that you might need. So, uh, okay, I'm not seeing any questions. So thank you guys very much for attending. As I said, this was the, the last in uh, this series of webinars that, that we had, uh, and we will be, um, you know, looking at other programming uh, things related to poultry. So thank you very much for joining us, and maybe we'll see you again another time. Bye-bye.